First, we will explore a few of the fundamental flaws that can doom the traditional sealant technique. Next, we'll take a look at where technology, new materials, and new techniques will guide this procedure over the next century. Finally, we're going to take a hard look at sealants and decide whether we should tinker with that technique or leave it altogether for the new minimally invasive composite technique. This photograph shows a typical occlusal surface of an upper second molar in an adolescent. This next slide shows the same tooth after disclosing solution. As you can imagine, trying to bond a sealant over such a contaminated surface can be compared to painting over rust. Let's take a look at how traditional painted on sealants are actually holding up under the microscope in a short movie titled The Sealant Failure Festival. These sealants were placed by well-meaning dental professionals and have been in service for less than two years. In case one, we see obvious leakage and active bacteria and decay. In case two, we see that part of the sealant is still in place. Part has fallen off and serious decay is progressing. The red carries indicator dye shows the decay has progressed under the sealant. In case three and four, the sealant looks excellent to the naked eye. As we evaluate it with the microscope, we find active decay underneath. In this case, and in many other cases, the sealant does more harm than good because it hides the decay and gives a false sense of security that the tooth is healthy and safe. On this final case, case number four, I am demonstrating the use of the wider of the fissurotomy burrs, which I prefer when removing old sealants and composites. It has a rounder end that has better end cutting potential. It is not surprising that the research has shown that traditional sealants have a 92% failure rate. Another problem with sealants, flowable composites, and paste composites is that these new acrylic filling materials often have bubbles that are nearly impossible to see and eliminate without advanced magnification. These bubbles create voids that allow bacteria to invade underneath these materials. A few years ago, my son Jeremy had an unfortunate experience with um, a tooth of his. He had a sealant put on it when he was young and uh, the sealant fell out so we had another sealant put on and then a few years ago at age 18 he began to have pain with that tooth. Um, we took him into the dentist and he had a lot of decay under the sealant. Um, at that point I called Dr. Clark who said that it, it really wasn't that uncommon for there to be decay under a sealant or what he would call a, a, a failed sealant. And so he not only ended up having to have a crown on that tooth, but he also had to have a root canal, which at age 18 I, I thought was awfully young for such extensive work. And so it's unfortunate that 
a $50 sealant ended up costing thousands of dollars in a lot of dentist visits for my son for a tooth that you know he needs to keep for the rest of his life. So I hope that the dental profession as a whole can take a step back and look at this supposedly preventive measure of sealants, see if there isn't a better process. And according to Dr. Clark, there is other alternatives. There's um, the use of magnification, special burrs, equipment, and uh, stronger materials that can be used as a preventative treatment. So I, I hope that the dental profession can incorporate these processes. Now that we have shown the limitations of traditional painted on sealants, we will go to a live patient treatment to demonstrate a much more permanent preventive treatment for occlusal decay. We call this the minimally invasive composite technique. Merrick presents with teeth numbers 14, 15, and 18 that are unrestored with varying levels of decay. We'll go in with the operating microscope and do a cursory examination and place a rubber dam and then restore the teeth as indicated. At low magnification, we see a slight discoloration on the occlusal of number 14. As we move up to the levels of magnification, we see some interesting patterns of darkening. As we typically see in posterior teeth like this, there is no radiographic decay present. Next, we apply a disclosing solution to aid us in complete plaque removal. Even with a microscope, we find that disclosing solution is absolutely essential. Many clinicians are under the false impression that phosphoric acid alone will clean the tooth and remove bacteria. It does neither. The tooth must be cleaned with sodium bicarbonate, pumice, and finally with fissurotomy burrs. Are you done, Nance? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here I am removing decay and decontaminating the grooves. There is simply no other way to thoroughly clean and inspect these deep, troublesome grooves. Once we discover significant dentinal caries, that area of the tooth changes from microdentistry to macrodentistry, and so we change to a round-ended large diamond or carbide burr. Let's compare the preoperative view with the mid-treatment view. 
Note the subtle discoloration suggesting decay. Contrast that to the gross decay that we actually uncover. This level of precision and permanence is difficult to achieve without magnification and the use of instruments such as the fisherotomy burrs. One of the critical diagnostic keys in advanced magnification is to roll the mirror at multiple angles. This is as important in endodontics as it is in restorative dentistry. Finding decay is much like finding canal systems. Instead of removing dentinal caries with the large, slow-speed round burr, I find it to be more conservative to use this 1 16th round burr at high speed. With the use of the microscope, we see that decay penetration is often uneven and follows the DEJ. This approach creates a more conservative cavity preparation, and the irregular surface provides better retention and resistance to microleakage. Beveling of occlusal enamel remains controversial. However, I find that it gives me the best chance to avoid those white lines that often form at the margins of composites. I am thinning the lightly filled resin with a dedicated air syringe, which has no water input, so it has less chance of moisture contamination. This is an important time for high magnification. So many clinicians incorporate bubbles at this stage.
The lightly filled resin, in this case OptiBond Solo Plus, is placed between layers to help avoid gaps. It is important to not let it remain as a large reservoir. It is there simply to facilitate the marriage between the flowable composite and the paste composite. There is definitely an art to massaging paste composite to avoid tugback and voids. We want to lubricate the burnisher with resin, never using a condenser like we did with amalgam, and then burnish the paste toward the margins. I don't monkey around with creating exotic anatomy because I find the longer I play with the paste composite, the higher the odds that it will begin to polymerize prematurely and leave a chalky finish and marginal gaps. I'll carve nice anatomy later with the fissurotomy burrs.